Just when we think that the leftovers couldn't get any crazier, that happens. And holy shit, guys. Uh, this can be my review for the leftovers, season 2, episode 9, 10, 13. And just, wow, guys. I am in utter shock. I mean, even though I watched this episode uh, like at, at like 1 o'clock in the morning last night, I am still in utter shock at that reveal. I cannot get over what happened. This episode was just so great, but are you guys surprised that this episode was just so great? I'm not, at least. I mean, this the season's been so great, but this episode was so great. I loved every minute of it, and there were so many amazing things about it. Plus, the title, 1013, was, like, perfect. I love the title. But then the twist at the end, we're going to get into that. There's a lot to talk about there. I will talk about what you guys want me to talk about because let's just face it, this is probably the most shocking twist I've seen, honestly, all year. Uh, right under is Mr. Robot's reveal of Elliot, um, of Mr. Robot being his father and Darlene being his sister. But other than that, and, well, spoiler if you haven't seen Mr. Robot, but other than that, guys, what an amazing episode. Let's just get into it. We start off in this very interesting way. We start off with Meg. Most of this episode is Meg-centric. Uh, eventually turns into Tommy-centric, but it was mainly Meg-centric. She's snorting cocaine in the bathroom. By the way, I love the 80s score on this episode. It really went well with uh, the Meg stuff. So she says, smile. Her mom asks Meg when the wedding is going to be. Her mom says she's just looking for a season because if it's, if it's spring then, and Meg says they're figuring it out, and her mom says she wants to pay for the wedding. You can tell this is a flashback because obviously Meg's not, you know, engaged anymore. And Meg says that she's relentless. Her mom says she's the most relentless person she's ever known. When she has a cause, there's no stopping her. Meg says she can't let her pay. Her mom asks why not since she treats her all to the time, including boots that she wanted. Meg says she didn't have her wallet, and she said she'd pay her back. Then she pulls out her wallet to find money, and her mom says she doesn't want her money. Meg says she insists. We realize that this takes place one day before the sudden departure, um, October 13th. And her mom tells her to date it for the 14th. She writes out the check, and her mom asks if it's one. If once she deposits it, she'll let her pay for the wedding. Her mom says she has to tell her a story, and Meg says she has to go to the bathroom, asks if it will take a while. She says it will only take a minute or two. Meg leaves, and her mom tells her not to let her forget. She goes in the bathroom to do more cocaine. I don't know why she's doing cocaine, but she's doing that. It's not really important. Uh, she goes back to the diner. Her mom has collapsed as the waiters gave her CPR, and uh, Meg just stands there in shock of what's going on. It's a really sad scene, and the fact that she had to watch her own mother die like that is really sad, and... Something I like about this is that they're not trying to make you think, oh, Meg is a good person. They're just trying to show why Meg is the way she is today. So on a bus, everyone is singing along to wait in the water except Meg and her fiancé, Darren. And the park ranger welcomes them to Miracle. They're on some sort of tour for Miracle. He goes over the conditions and rules of all. Meg and Darren are only there for a tour, which Darren says won't take what they won't take, but Meg says that they will. They then take an audio tour. We find out that the crack in the street is actually from a gas explosion on the 14th. I like this little reveal here. That's the only thing they have yet to reveal. Well, not the only thing. We'll get into the biggest thing. But uh, in terms of what we saw in the first episode, the only thing we didn't know about is that crack in the street. And I likely found it's from a gas explosion and not from the earthquakes. Um, apparently, instead of repairing the damage, the town has left as a reminder. And they then see Cecilia and find out about her story. Cecilia asks they want a picture, and Darren tells her that they're good. Meg then stops the tour, and he asks why she's stopping. Meg says there's a man, Isaac, in there that can help her. And I'm like, okay, now I know why we're seeing this. Because at first it was like, why are we seeing this? And Darren asks if it's another sidekick. Meg says, Meg says she's heard amazing things about him. And he asks if that's why they came to Miracle. She says he's only been doing readings for a few weeks. And, they, and then says he's the real deal. He says he wants her to find what she's looking for. But doesn't understand how the guy will be any different than the others. And she says it's because this place is special. You know, she's convinced that it's going to go well. That nothing, that this guy is legit. And that she's going to get what she wants from him. So she says it's because this place is special. And he's from there. Isaac asks about her mom, who died the day before departure. He tells her he's sorry, and she says it was two years ago, and she's okay. It was cool to see Isaac again. We have not seen Isaac since episode four, so four, so it was cool to see him again, and she's okay. People say she's lucky that she knows what happened to her, where she went, and clearly she's not okay. She's clearly affected by her mom's death, and that's why she's going to him. 
and Isaac says she loses her mother, and then the next day, no one gives a shit about either of them because they think the world is ending, and he tells her to sit down. She asks if he wants her hand print, and he says that is for people who want to know their future, and she doesn't want to do that. She shows him one of her mom's old sweaters because the others wanted something to, that belonged to her. By the way, let me just say, Liv Tyler, this entire episode... Another actress that needs to get nominated. Seriously, every single actress on this show. Every single actor, every single actress. I cannot trust enough. Just nominate every single one of them for Emmys because, once again, Liv Tyler, amazing performance. Um, he says he doesn't need anything from her. He gives her something to chew, but she's not to swallow it. He opens up his palm and tells her to spit it out. He matches it with his hands, asks what she wants to know. She asks if she can just ask her, and he says she can ask him. She says she was going to tell her something just before she got up from the table and to go to the bathroom, and she wants to know what it was and what she was going to tell her. And he says people on their deathbeds, they have a chance to put their last words together, make them count something poetic, but usually when they don't know, they're about to die. They say a lot of stupid shit. And she has what he means, and he says he can tell her what she wants, but he's but he's been doing this long enough to know no matter what he says, it's not going to fix what's broken inside. And that's true. I mean, she clearly is affected, and he's not going to change that. What he says is not going to change how she feels. So she says that's bullshit. She says he now he he doesn't know. He's not fucking real. She's going to be disappointed because he's not real. And, sa and he says, now this is very interesting. I didn't think this scene was necessarily important, but it turned out to be very important. He says her mother sent her salad back because she asked for no walnuts. She's very polite about it, though, and he asks if she's sure she wants to know. And she says to tell her, and we don't know what he tells her. She leaves. We don't know what he tells her after this, and I like that we don't know because clearly whatever he tells her very much affects her, and we don't know what it is. Something else I liked here is that I would usually, I really did not like Meg that much last season. Meg was probably my least favorite character, honestly. I really did not like Meg as much as, you know, um, some of the other characters last season. And this really did make me like Meg. Just everything we saw in this episode, I definitely really liked. But again, they're not trying to get us to like Meg. They're just showing, they're just trying to get us to understand her situation. I really like that. So... She then goes back to Darren and sa and she says he wasn't the real deal. She then sits on a park bench holding her mom's sweater and smelling, and then she cries. And then she sees Evie! Yes, Evie is back in this episode. Not This is not the only time we see her, though. We'll get into the thing I want. I know you guys want me to talk about. And, she and I was like, is this really Evie? Why is Evie seeing her? She asked her if she wants a baby carrot because you can't cry when you eat them. It's impossible. Meg thanks her. They eat, and Evie asks if it's working. She says she would tell her a joke, and uh, she doesn't know any, and then tells her the broken pencil joke, and now we know what that broken pencil joke was all about. She got it from Meg, and it did, again, that didn't seem like a big deal, the joke she told her father. It didn't seem like something that big. But something I love about this episode is that they make things in the first episode that didn't seem like a big deal, a huge deal, and I love that. Um, and they introduce one another. Evie says she's sorry she didn't find whatever she was looking for there, and no one ever does, and... Something I like about Evie is that you can kind of tell that the personality we saw of her, you know, her kind of like high spirit, just happy personality, it's kind of fake because Evie clearly is a bit more damaged than we thought. I mean, there definitely is more going on with her. So I like seeing that, you know, we thought we know the character of Evie, but if you think about it, we never were in Evie's perspective in the first episode. We were in John's perspective. This is how John saw his daughter. That's really what I thought we were in. We, we saw how John saw his daughter, we saw how Erica saw their daughter, and we saw how Michael saw his sister. That really is what that had to do with. So, Darren goes to Meg and uh, asks what that was, who that was, and she says she gave her carriage, tells him she wants to leave. They get back on the bus, and she spits out the carrots, and as soon as they get back on, everyone again sings along, and then we're in the present, and... I love how long that flashback was. It didn't really seem like it was necessary, but it honestly is very necessary. We see in the present, Meg is with the GR, forcefully open the the uh, this this school bus and attacks some guy who turns eventually out to be the bus who turns out to be the bus driver. And uh, she then puts a grenade on the bus that is filled with children and realizes the school is they lock and shut. All the kids scream out as Meg walks away smiling and. You can tell right away, they are, the GR is a lot more aggressive now. Like, we did not think the GR was that bad. Yeah, they're a lot worse now. So, Meg then goes into a room where the GR are, and one of the women writes bus, and unlike Patty, Meg actually doesn't want them to write about it. Meg says, you know, if we're going to have a conversation, let's have a conversation. And I thought that was interesting. 
So basically, the woman says they thought they had an understanding after the incident with the dogs, but a school bus, they don't target children. And Meg says no one gets hurt. No one got hurt. The woman says it's the same reason they don't allow them to live in their houses. The authorities would overreact. And she says they stone each other to death, but are afraid of the authorities and ask for an explanation. Now, I do see Meg's point here. You know, if they're allowed to hurt themselves, why not kill some people? Why not? And the woman says it's useless. Meg says to not give the mysterious bullshit she's been inside for almost a year now. Needs to know why they're not fucking stepping it up. Which is true. I mean, Meg kind of felt like the outsider last year. You know, she came into the GR after what happened. And she left her fiancé and everything. And we, you know, she was kind of in that time where she didn't know if she wanted to talk or not. And I really loved this because we saw that Meg um, clearly is now the leader of the GR. She's much more aggressive than Patty, and I think it definitely is very interesting. And that's one of the reasons I like that we saw Patty's episode last week, because we saw how Patty does things juxtaposed to how Meg does things. So she says they're forgetting, and if she's supposed to be living reminder, it's not enough for her to stand outside their houses, staring them until they start screaming in her face, and she asks why she has to just stand there when, they, when she can just put out her cigarettes out in their eye, that's a reminder. And the woman says violence is weakness, and Meg says that she's wrong. She's not the only one that feels that way. The woman asks she's con uh, contacting the other houses again, and she asks why she would be doing that. And the woman says there are rumors she's playing her own action on October 14th, and she says she's not authorized to plan her own action. The woman says it's not like she's trying to purchase explosives. Meg says that's ridiculous. She says it is, and she says she takes it... She takes it, her and her house will be at the Heroes Day celebration in Dobbs Ferry. She says they've been painting their signs all week. The woman makes sure she's serious about it. Meg says they can count on her. She asks if they can because they count on her to handle Tommy. They lost 10 members from New Rochelle last week. And remember, all of that's going on with Tommy is bullshit. He's not actually hugging their pain away. It's bullshit what he's doing. But I really like seeing Tommy in this episode. And when we played Tommy, by far, I think his best episode. I really loved him in this episode. I really liked him in episode 3. But that was more of Lori's episode than it was Tommy's, and I definitely loved like seeing Tommy in this episode. So, she sees what Tommy's doing. Tommy is telling his story to a bunch of people, the same story he told at the end of episode 3, the same bullshit story. Meg walks in, sits down, and I was really like, holy shit, what is Meg going to do here? But she sits down because I don't think she wants to cause a, a ruckus. She wants people to think that she's not with the GR. And he has to wants a hug, gets a bunch of donations, hugs many individuals, and then sees Meg. And obviously is pretty, you know, not pretty, you know, um, surprised. Because the last time he saw her, of course, she raped him. And he doesn't really know how to feel about it. So he asks her if she wants him to take her pain away. He hugs her. And she says that she can do this for real. And Lori then goes to Tommy and we get that huge fallout from them. As we know, Lori and Tommy had a big fight, and we see in this episode. She asked me if we forgot about Paramus, and she says she had 20 people there waiting to see him, and she tried to call him, but he didn't pick up. She's had to give their donations back, and he asks if she means their money. She says they're going to need to make a permanent space, which Tommy says they don't. She says they do. It's been a month, and renting out the halls is very expensive, and it's just, it's not safe. They need a bigger space, and... Basically, he says he doesn't want their money, he doesn't want to build a fucking church. He tells them when they pay them, it is their commitment to change, and if it were free, it wouldn't work. They're helping people, and he says he's the only one up there lying, and she says they're not. He says they stole it. She said if they took Wayne's story and used it on people, and used it, people would believe in them. It doesn't work on him, and she asked him if something happened, he says it did. Her book didn't, and I thought he was going to tell her what happened with Meg, but that's not what he tells her. And he says it did, her book didn't work out. We found out the book that she was writing in episode 3, it did not work out. And she asked him if something happened, and he says it did. And uh, basically, so she figured she would pimp out her own fucking son so that she wouldn't have to ruin, run people out anymore. So that she didn't have to feel bad about leaving her whole fucking family. She throws a chair, obviously she's really pissed. She goes right to Tommy and slaps him. And then she tells him that she's sorry. He looks like he's about to like kill her. He walks out, and that was insane. So Tommy then sees a car outside, and he's back in the hat he always wore in season one, which I thought was interesting. And we see kind of showing how Tommy's the only one that really hasn't changed at all. A lot of them have changed, but Tommy really hasn't. He's still the same disturbed individual he was in the first season. And he sees a dog come out of the car. A woman tells the dog to stay and leaves. He goes to the GR, and 
I loved this scene with Tommy. He obviously is really pissed off. He tells them that he was there a month ago trying to recruit them. He just wanted them to come get better with some group, great group therapy from his mommy. That's literally how he says it. He's that upset. And I believe he's, like, drunk or something here. He then talks to the girl who, tried, who he tried to recruit but blew the whistle in his face that got him sent to Meg. He asks if she knows Meg, and he asks where her whistle is. Tears apart the room, tells her to blow the fucking whistle. That brings Meg, and he asks where she is. Meg then goes inside where Tommy is getting beaten up. She asks him what he wants, and he says she said she could do it for real, take his pain away, and she pulls up a chair and sits, tells him to just hug himself, and he says he'll do anything he just wants to be a part of this, and she says that he doesn't understand this and isn't looking for this, which, no, I don't think Tommy's looking for the GR. He's looking for a family, and honestly, yeah, I would agree with Meg that I think Tommy really does want a family. I mean, think about it. He's been separated from Kevin and Jill and Nora. He's been separated from, you know, his, his father and sister, for the past two seasons, and hasn't seen him except once. He saw Jill once, and that was it. Other than that, they've barely seen each other. Yes, they've texted, like Lori says, but he hasn't physically seen Jill, and they haven't really talked a lot. So, basically, she says she doesn't understand, and basically, he says, if you want a fucking family, go to Texas, where his dad and sister move, and she asks, where is Texas? And he says, Miracle, and she says, the town is Jordan, Miracle is a national park that surrounds and protects it from those who have corrupt its exceptional properties. Now, I thought that was interesting. I don't think that was something we knew before, and she tells him she, she just so happens to be heading there herself. Laughs maniacally, and Meg is just so creepy throughout this whole episode. Let me just say that, but she's awesome as well. I love Liv Tyler, like I said. They then drive to Jarden. They hear the crickets, and she turns down the radio and tells Tommy her phone is in the glove of Carmen, which kind of leads me to believe that the cricket that John was looking for was just a ringtone. That's kind of what I think is going on there. Um, if you remember the first episode, that cricket that John was looking for, I feel like that's what they're trying to show. So... She talks to someone and asks how many, and she says she needs to see the bridge herself alone. She will be there in the morning. She closes the glove compartment, and she says this is not hard knowing what is going... This is hard not knowing what is going to happen, and he must be curious as to what she's going to do when they get to Texas, because it's pretty fucking amazing what she's going to do. And he asks straight out why she raped him. And he doesn't say, why'd you rape me? He says, why'd you fuck me? Which I think was interesting. And he knows why she poured gasoline on him and threatened him to try to send a message to Lori. But why'd she rape him? And she doesn't respond. She pulls up to a honky-tonk and asks him if he wants to go dancing. They go into a bar. She then drinks a shot and tells him it's his turn. He takes a shot. She asks who the blonde is since both his parents have dark hair. And he realizes that she even knows his parents. And, uh... She then, uh, you know, he explains that, uh, that he's, that he's not, that Kevin is not his biological father. Him and his mother got together when he was four and adopted him. And she says her, her dad died when she was a baby and her mom got remarried to a guy named Elias and he wanted them to be an official family. She was really young, but she remembers going down to the courthouse and everything the judge gave her a lollipop and he left her mom a year later and she never saw him again. Again, I think just showing how, you know, bad Meg's life has been. She asked for more shots and he asked where her mom is now. She says she's in space. When she died, they had her cremated and shot her ashes into space. And she says she didn't like the idea of being in a box in the ground. She was really into astrology. There's a company that does it and it only cost $12,000. And he asks her what's happening right now. They kiss. She pulls him in for a dance. She says this feels nice and he agrees. She says, and she says, she doesn't say, now here's the thing. This is interesting what she says. She says to get him pregnant, and she says she just, well, she wanted to get him pregnant. That's why she raped him. She didn't say to get me pregnant. She, I, she said to get you pregnant. So that's interesting that she said that. She said to get you pregnant. Now, how did Meg have this ability? I don't understand how she means to get you pregnant. Is it possible to get someone pregnant? I mean, we've established that this isn't necessarily the real world, so... I don't really know what that means, but that was very interesting what Meg said there uh, when she said to get him pregnant. So, they leave the bar, they make it to Jarden, and Meg asks the man to open the chain. She drives, and there are a bunch of GR members there, and what I love about this is that obviously there weren't GR in Miracle now, and now they're there now. So the man tells her somebody got on the property. The man says to let him go. He didn't do anything. The GR man says there was a bike trail about a mile behind the property. He decided to go off at it, and she asks where he found him, and he said he was right outside the barn. He asks if she saw her. He says they think so, and he says he didn't see anything and doesn't even know what they're talking about, and you really see this man as just an innocent man. He didn't really do anything wrong. The GR member says they can keep him here until tomorrow once he's here. It won't matter anymore, and she tells him to stop 
stone him. She literally says stone him. It was it was crazy. So Tommy goes to Meg. She asks him what he's doing, and she says she doesn't want him to follow her. He wanted to follow her, and now they're there, and they're done. And he says what he's what he's supposed to do. And she gives him a stone, tells him to make himself useful. As she goes in the warehouse, she clearly is just gonna make him do whatever the fuck he wants. And Tommy watches the man be stone. He puts the stone down. He clearly does not want to be involved with this. And, uh, he's with the GR. One of the women asks if he came with Meg. He says he did. She tells him she's going to change everything. And again, we don't know what Meg's initial plan is, which I like. I like that we don't really know what she's going to do here. So, Meg drives away. Tommy sees her leave. Meg then goes to Dobbs Ferry, and Matt sees her. Now, if you remember the last time that Matt saw her was when he was attacked in, like, episode 8, so when he tried to talk to Meg, and they, they stoned, they tried, they, she attacked him. He asks what she's doing there, and she remembers who he is, and he says she's talking and asks if she left the GR. She says she did. He tells her Kevin and Nora have been taking care of Mary, and this is when you realize that he really doesn't know what's going on with Kevin and Nora. He doesn't know that Nora left Kevin. He doesn't know that Nora's with Mary and that Kevin's not. He doesn't know about any of that because he's stuck there, and... She asks if the Rangers won't just let him in, and he says their rules are very particular. She says that doesn't seem fair, and he says he can't get over it. Seeing her in Texas, it's pretty amazing. And she says if they were to run to each other anywhere would be a coincidence, but there is mir but they're a miracle, and she thinks that they came there for the same reason. And he asks what it is, and she says it's because this place is safe now, and that she's left the GR, and it's not true, obviously. Um, she says it was really hard to get away because... They're everywhere, but she started to think to herself, there has to be someone where the GR wouldn't work because in order to get someone to join them, that person needs to be in pain. The people on the other side of the bridge were spared, and they're just not suffering like the rest of them. And Meg does, Matt does not believe her. He says he doesn't think that she's being totally honest with him. And I was like, oh shit, Matt does not believe her. He's actually very smart here. And she has to be lied to a priest, and the way that she refers to him as a priest is just so creepy. She's like, do you think I'd lie to a priest? And she says today's the anniversary of her mother's death, and he asks if she remembers attacking him in Mapleton. She was out. He was outside her house handing out flyers with her mother's photo on them. He says he knows it was cruel, and he says he's sorry for digging into her life like that, but he was doing everything he could to get her to feel again. And she says she had forgotten about it, and he says he apologized for her being for being her living reminder, and... She asks him what he's waiting for, him, and uh, and he, all the people out there, they're so close, and she says it's right there just over the bridge. He wants it, but he's not doing anything to get it, so what is it he's waiting for? And she asks if he wants her to tell him, and she says he's waiting for her. So I don't know if Meg's going to try to get Matt to join the GR or something, but clearly she has some kind of plan with Matt, and we don't know what it is yet, so we'll have to see what happens, I guess, next week. <laughs> and then we get to... What was the most, what by far is the most shocking reveal I've seen in a very long time. I literally scream when this happens, and Tommy wakes up, bolts out of the GR, he then sees the door, goes into a room, he doesn't want anything to do with that. He sees this room, there's this trailer there, just locked shut, he grabs an axe and opens it up, and he then sees Evie in the trailer, he asks who she is, she has joined the GR along with Taylor and Violet, she writes down that doesn't matter, and that's how the episode ends. Talk about a mind fuck right there, guys. Seriously. Evie, Taylor, and Violet faked their departure. They're in the GR, and for whatever reason, we don't know why. Now, this twist is amazing. I love how shocking this was. On any other show, this could have failed. But something I love that Damian Lindelof, sa that Damian Lindelof said is that he did whatever he could to make sure this was, you know... Um, not, you know, the, to make sure that the, he kept this as hidden as possible. To make it seem like the GR was not even that big of a deal. But now we're realizing the GR was the villain the whole time. They were at the forefront of all of this. Now, how Meg got to Evie and how she had a connection to her and how they reconnected, we don't know. But you know what this did, guys? They watched some of the things in the first episode. If you guys remember, there's that scene in the first episode where they go, to, they're in the pool, you know, they're swimming, and then they see... Uh, Dr. Goodhart, and then they go into the car and they're completely silent. I didn't think anything of it, really. I didn't really think anything of it except, oh, maybe they're just tired or something like that. But now we're realizing, no, they were practicing. They were practicing to be in the GR. And 
remember that cricket that John was looking for? I feel like that was Meg's ringtone. That for somehow Evie and Meg's phone or something like that. I'm not really sure, but what an incredible twist. This really changes everything because now we know that Evie didn't disappear, that there was no departure, that nobody kidnapped her, that she left on her own. Evie, Taylor, and Violet were going to leave to join the GR. That's clearly why they left. They left their phones in there to make it seem like they did disappear. And the fact that they faked it is going to be incredible. And it does look like John is going to see her next week because we see him say to Evie what happened. He sees her again. We don't know what's going to happen there. And I love that. But damn, guys, what an incredible incredible episode. I didn't really think this episode was going to be as important as it was, but it turns out it's probably the most important episode of this season, and every episode this season has been important. Um, next week is the season finale. I can't believe it, guys. Next week is the season finale. I've been so into this season, and it could be the series finale because Damon Lindelof said he doesn't know if he can top this season, and I really like the way that Damon Lindelof thinks because, you know, he kind of thinks of it as, well, the season is just so great. We've made it our best. How can we top it? I don't know if it's possible. After the twist, how do you top that? I don't know how you top that. It's going to be incredible to see what happens in the finale. I have no idea what's going to happen in the finale now, and I love that. Um, a lot of possibilities here. What is Meg's initial plan? We don't know what her plan is. Obviously, it involves Evie, Taylor, and Violet. They're clearly involved, um, but they don't want anyone to know they're alive. Now that Tommy's found them, what is he going to do? Now, Tommy, of course, doesn't know that these three girls have disappeared. He doesn't know anything that's going on in Miracle. He doesn't know anything that's going to happen here. So what's going to happen? Now, apparently, now Nora was right. Nora was right the entire time. And I didn't really think that Nora was right. But no, Nora is right. And they're alive. And we're going to have to see what happens with that. Because probably Nora's going to be like, well, you know, I told you that they were alive. And we're going to see what happens with that. I am assuming Kevin's going to reunite with Nora next week and Jill as well, and uh, we're going to see what happens with that. Uh, that definitely is going to be very interesting to see what happens there. Is Lori going to find Tommy? Tommy is in Miracle now that we know that. Um, we know he's in Miracle, but he's not with Kevin. He might go to Kevin, though. I kind of feel like after this, he's going to go to Kevin and Jill. Why wouldn't he go to them? Um, because, you know, he hasn't seen them. I feel like that's where he wants to go. He's probably going to be terrified of what's going on. I'm not really sure what's going to happen there. We're going to have to see what happens with that. Why did Evie do this? You know, what was her initial reason? Like I said, I really feel like she's not as happy as it seemed like she was. I feel like Evie's a lot more upset with the world and kind of feels like the safeness of the world is just bullshit and she doesn't believe it. She wants something more real and she doesn't believe really what's going on. It's very interesting. I don't really know what's going to happen and I like that uncertainty. We also saw a shot in the promo of Mary in without her chair. So I don't know what that means. That's very interesting. And the words that Meg said to Tommy to get you pregnant. I don't know what that means. I really don't know what that means. I'm very interested in seeing what's going to happen there. What is Meg going to do with Matt? Clearly she has something planned for him at the end when she said, you know, um, you've been waiting for me. I don't know what that means. I don't know what she's talking about there. We'll have to see what that has to do with but overall, guys, an absolutely amazing episode. They top themselves more and more every week. That twist was genuinely shocking. I have no idea what's going to happen. This has gotten me to rethink everything. It really has. I mean, why would they do this? Why would they disappear? Why would they fake a departure like this? Why would anyone do this? I don't really know why they did this, but clearly they had a reason for doing this. And we're going to find out what it is next week, why they did this. Um... We'll have to see. And also, how did Taylor and Violet meet Meg? How did, how did this happen? How did Evie get back in touch with her? These are things we need to know. The good thing is next week's episode was an hour and 15 minutes, so we should be able to... And Damien Lindelof said it will be a satisfying conclusion if the show doesn't come back for season three, which I'm not doubtful, but I'm not like... 100% sure. More like 85%. I feel like it's gonna come back, but I don't know when it's gonna come back. I do feel like it's eventually gonna come back, but we'll have to see. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. Damn, what an amazing episode this was. And like I said, it's got me to rethink everything. I love this show, and it just gets better and better every week. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for Homeland, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.